I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city the, on the, earth. Bop, bop, boom. Alrighty, hello everybody, and welcome back to the second episode of The Most Haunted City on Earth. My name is Madison Timmons, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Susie. Hello, everybody. And we have a very special guest here today. We have William Mark McCullough, who is a local Savannah actor. He is our, uh, I would say, most famous actor from Savannah, if you will. Um, but he is also a film director, and he actually just worked on a film called A Savannah Haunting. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, so, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm so happy to be here today. This will awesome. be a lot of fun discussing this. Uh, yeah, I... I don't know that I'm the most famous actor in Savannah. It's a very uh, small pool to, to pull from, but <laughs> sure. uh, I'll take it. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in Savannah, and uh, after high school, I left as fast as I could because I hated it here. And it took me going to a lot of places. I was in D.C. for uh, for school, and then I was in L.A. for a long time. And uh, I came back several years ago and just fell in love with the city as an adult mm -hmm. and decided to stay, and uh, I love it. You know, I get to travel for work. Um, but I always enjoy coming home. And, and it, it's shocking to me the number of friends I've had from L.A. who visit me here in Savannah and six months later move here. Uh, yep. I actually have a friend who just moved here last week from L.A. Uh, the city is just so wonderful, and it's a great place to uh, relax in. Sure, and the dark charm. It sucks people in. Uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, why did you want to make a film like A Savannah Haunting? You know, it was interesting. I... Uh, I came back to Savannah specifically because I had a family member who got sick, mm -hmm. and it was the first time as an adult that I'd spent any real time uh, in Savannah, and it was the first time that I'd really spent any time uh, in my dad's home. Uh, he had been there since the 70s, and uh, I grew up with my mom, uh, but I'd, you know, I'd see my dad in the summers and weekends and what have you, and then when I would visit Savannah, I'd always stay at his house, but it would be for three or four days tops. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is when I would stay there, I would have these interesting experiences that, that at the moment I didn't realize the nature of them. And it was only when I was at that home for an extended period of time that I started seeing, you know, seeing and experiencing things. Um, so, you know, I was kind of focused on, on family stuff, health issues with, with family. And my uh, producing partner, Alexis Nelson, she was coming to Savannah just to give me moral support and be there with me and help me, you know, through, through a tough time. And she stayed at the house. And I didn't tell her the history of the house. Like, the whole family oh, knew boy. the house had this, this history of being haunted. But we didn't really talk about it. And I certainly didn't tell strangers that because it can make you seem a little odd, right? Yep. <laughs> but it became very obvious very quickly to her that something very scary was in that house. And uh, so she actually was the one who suggested to me that I take the things that had happened in the home and write a script based on those things. So that's really where mm -hmm. it started. Uh, you know, I always tell people, like, I, I never call myself a writer. Uh, Chris is an amazing writer. Yes. I'm pretty good at writing about things that are very clearly happening in front of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sure. <laughs> I'm a good note taker of life, but I'm not good at, like, just coming up with crazy things. Uh, so I literally just wrote this, uh, this script. Um, based on things that had happened in the house, experiences that had happened. And inter interestingly, I, I included some things in the script, and we can get into this later, mm -hmm. that I thought I made up, only to learn later they were true. Oh. It's kind of interesting. But, yeah. But that was it. Uh, it, was, it was literally my, uh, my partner was like, you really need to capture this uh, you know, in a screenplay. And um, then we decided to make the movie. That's awesome. So would you c consider yourself a clairvoyant psychic of sorts or a clairaudient psychic clairsentient all of those things i don't know what any of that means but sure I'm gonna, say, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna say no to all of that well i mean technically what you're saying are um s symptoms i guess so being like <laughs> indications yeah that, that's a better word for it yes but um essentially claire senses are um you know like seeing spirits hearing spirits um feeling spirits mm -hmm. So, I mean, so everybody kind of has like a, a touch of these things. Some people are just more open to them. What so. I would say is that uh, pretty much anyone that comes to my house senses things. Sure. Even if they don't yeah. sense things in other places. 
that's a pretty powerful entity. So, you know. Yeah. Well, and fascinatingly enough, the house itself mm-hmm. is even built in a pattern that is very conducive for spiritual and uh, paranormal activity. It has basically two wings that flank you on either side and a pit in the middle. And that pit uh, has what seems to be an aquarium, mm-hmm. uh, but like a built-in one. Mm-hmm. So you had like at one time water at the in the pit. It's basically a well in a lot oh. of ways. So that specific pattern of energy that goes up and locks itself on both sides with no egress, no, no escape, that is very common with hauntings. Like you could literally say the architecture itself sure. lends itself to catching spirits, holding them in place because there's no place to go. It's not a, f- it's not a fluid house. <laughs> it, yeah. is, it is disorienting in a lot of ways. When mm-hmm. you're in one room, you have a sensation of where you are in space. Am I facing east? Am I facing north? But that house, it's very confusing. You're standing there and you don't really know spatially where you are, which is the kind of spiritual you know, uh, uh, trap you, you would set for a ghost. If you wanted mm-hmm. to catch a ghost, <laughs> that's yeah. the kind of thing you would want to do is try to make sure that it was in the corners, you know, because people, when they talk about ghost stories, they're always like, you know, the basement and the attic. And, and a mm-hmm. lot of that reasoning is there's no logical escape mm-hmm. when you're there because ghosts don't really have a whole lot of sensory perception. They don't have eyes, ears. You know, they're not utilizing the same instincts that we have to move around. And it's it's interesting because I feel like um, I've actually investigated Mark's house, and I feel like while we were there, we were, we were getting a hold of the idea that it wasn't just like the familial. It wasn't just uh, like the land it was drawing spirits. It felt like there were, there were spirits from all around who were just drawn to the property. Mm. So, yeah, you, you oftentimes find in ghost stories, um, you know, well, this was the site of a terrible murder, and this yes. was the site of, and, and this angry person was here. But there's a lot of untraceables in Mark's house. A lot of mm. interesting debris uh, was also a part of it. You know, just, just a fascinating uh, location. So on top of there being something significant happening, there's also kind of this, if anybody walked in with a ghost on their back, and we, I think we talked about this last time, yep. if, you, if you bring a spirit there, the spirit's likely to stay. Mm-hmm. So for anybody out there who has a ghost on them, go to Mark's house. And, yeah, and just drop them it, off. Just, <laughs> yeah. get, get it off your back. And Mark, and Mark loves it. He's, he'll write a movie about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. We had, we had several mediums come to the house, mm-hmm. and one of them described the house as being like an onion, just layer mm-hmm. after layer after layer of different things. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it is a, it's interesting when people visit my house, uh, they often get disoriented and kind of don't, even though I'll show them around, they get very turned around very quickly, uh, with the layout, which is pretty unique, mm-hmm. but it's also simplistic. So it's weird mm-hmm. that it, because I noticed that too. It's like, it's a very simple layout and yet you still get disoriented. You're like, mm-hmm. Oh, am I facing the back? Am I, yeah. is, is this right? You know, um, and, and there are quirky hallways and quirky you know, caveats and things like that. So and trap sure. doors and trap doors. Tunnels. There's a trap <laughs> door. <laughs> things, yes. and, and the second you add a trap door, yeah, you're, yeah. you're living in a, in a, you're in just a horror asking movie. For right. It. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so have you ever had a paranormal experience outside of the house or? I have not. Wow. No, that's pretty like, you know, I, I've never considered myself, uh, certainly I'm in no way sensitive to spirits sure. at all. And I've always been rather, agnostic about it mm-hmm. you know um again there were things that happened when we were when we were kids at my dad's house that were spooky and creepy but you grow up and you go oh that was when i was a kid that mm-hmm. was just whatever uh, you know so i've always kind of had the idea about anything that i don't discount anything out of hand you know it's mm-hmm. like I, i've just learned there's so much in this world that we don't understand and my knowledge is so limited uh i'm not a believer in things necessarily but i'm certainly not mm-hmm. a skeptic either sure um, but at my house, it, it just became so crystal clear that something really out of the ordinary was going on. Mm-hmm. And it would have been easy for me to chalk it up to maybe I'm going crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly a possibility. Sure, absolutely. Definitely. Uh, it, if it weren't for the fact that numerous people were experiencing and sensing the exact same things at different times, mm-hmm. um, you know, for instance, when, you know, before my dad passed away, I'm, I'm 
remember I was sitting downstairs in one of the downstairs living rooms and my dad was asleep on the couch and his girlfriend at the time was sitting next to him and she's watching TV and I can clearly hear the footsteps upstairs. And it's just mm-hmm. the three of us there, but I don't want to freak this girl out. So I'm not <laughs> saying anything. And eventually she turns the TV down and she's, I see her looking around and she's like, Mark, do you, do you hear that? And I was like, yeah. She says, someone's upstairs. I'm like, trust me, there's no one upstairs. <laughs> yeah. At this point I, I was already very aware of what's going on. And so she freaks out and runs upstairs to check. And of course there was no one there, but mm-hmm. we both could clearly hear the footsteps. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of started digging into this, started talking to people who uh, had, had been living in the house, you know, decades ago, uh, people had visited the house and it was shocking for me to listen to conversations as they described experiences I mean, literally exact experiences that I had experienced and never told them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that told me, okay, something's going on here that's not me going crazy. Yes, absolutely. I feel like a lot of people have that same sensation when they experience the paranormal and they're not necessarily believers. Um, Because like as children, you know, children are very susceptible to spirits because they haven't had to put on all the armor that we put on as adults and close ourselves off to these sort of things. But as we get older, if we're still experiencing them, it's very easy to think like, well, I'm just going crazy. Maybe I have, I had too much caffeine. I didn't sleep enough, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. But uh, my parents actually, they, when they first experienced a spirit, they had a very similar reaction because I also grew up in a haunted house. So um, I grew up in a house in Florida which you can imagine, uh, that already is asking for spirits um, just because of the nature of Florida. Um, But you see, uh, we actually had a Native American family living in our home. And so my parents, uh, one of the first experiences that they had was uh, hearing footsteps and things of that nature when nobody was upstairs. But then one day my dad walked into my room while I was sleeping and there was a family in my room watching over me and so he freaked as you can imagine because he's never seen a spirit he knew I could see them but he's like I've never seen anything so you know it's uh really common because he thought he was going crazy and then I was like no I've seen him you know I've seen the spirits and whatnot so you know if you grow up in a haunted house it's uh pretty common to go through that psychological (laughs) turmoil if you will Mm -hmm. but I've um, always made the analogy that it's um, it's very much like radio. Uh, like all of our brains are radios. And when we're young, we just kind of like to fiddle with the dial, go up and down the, the, the radio and, and sense all these other broadcasts. But we are basically badgered into one channel, the reality station. And you have to be on the reality station because if you're not on the reality station, everyone else is just going to think you're crazy. So you stay on that reality station. You have to be on that reality station Any deviation from that station will make you seem insane. But some people have traumatic experiences, mm-hmm. accidents, near-death experiences, and it just notches them just one you know, small frame away from the reality station, and now they start picking up these other stations. Mm-hmm. And then I think of houses like Mark's, which are broadcasting. Broadcasting so powerfully that they bleed into the reality station. They overwhelm the airwaves. And so when you think of, of, of our perception as actually malleable, our perception is what makes reality work. And it's the agreement we all came to <laughs> that the reality we live in is not full of ghosts and monsters and everything else. We, we, we've focused in on a reality that we can survive in. That doesn't mean that all these other broadcasts aren't happening. That doesn't mean that all these other things aren't going on. And occasionally you'll trip into a place that is broadcasting so powerfully that it doesn't matter what station you're on, you're still going to get some of that coming through so you know I always try to tell people that it's it's not a question of 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 belief and faith and 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 things like that it's 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 holding on to the channel that we we are most comfortable in yeah because uh, what I find very interesting especially in in Mark's case is oftentimes when people have haunting experiences they immediately go into story mode they, e- they immediately try to come up with something that they can take from their experience and hand to the next person and say, I experienced this. And, uh, and Mark has done one of, the, one of the greatest efforts of that by, by making a movie. You know, uh, th- the most acceptable story that we can tell is, is now, you know, uh, a film or television or, or you know, mm-hmm. you'll produce a book or something like that. To make art out of an experience 
is we're compelled to when we have these experiences. I think uh, Alexis was very much in that mode of you've got to tell this story. You know, she had this experience in the house and realized that unless you tell it, it, it becomes insular. You know, mm-hmm. you, you feel it like almost building up pressure inside you. It's like, oh, we, we've got to express that this is happening and that this is going on. And I think that's what ghost stories are. They're letting off the steam from the people who, who yep. experience it, you know, and they share it because there are other people who just have that faint knowledge or, or they're fully aware and they need validation or they need introduction to the idea that, yeah, normal people have this. This isn't, this isn't for people who are, you know, wearing turbans with diamonds in them yeah. and sitting around a, a crystal ball. This is a, a, an experience of being human, of, of sensing, feeling things that we are told all our lives aren't there. All our lives we're, we're, we're being convinced to either neglect it or to lock it out. So when somebody has an experience, especially one as, as you know, uh, concrete as yours, and because so many people were able to validate and, and come together and say, I had this, you know, when I was at your house, I felt this, I, I had this. And that creates this, this narrative that unless you share it, it'll eat you. <laughs> yeah. it'll, 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 it'll just be this thing that you sit in your house going, oh, all right, everybody, everybody sees this and feels this. Yeah, you know, and what's interesting is... Um, Working on the film, when I was writing the script, and then we went to pre-production, and when we started filming, um, the things that are in the house very much, I think, enjoyed the process. Uh, After we wrapped, about two months later, our lead actress, uh, Jenna Shaw, happened to be in Savannah, and so she said, hey, I kind of swing by and say hi. I said, of course. So she comes in, and she walks into the main room, as you refer to it, the pit. That's such a great (laughs) description. I never thought of it that way, but yeah. And we're standing there, and I'm the only one home. And suddenly doors all over the house start slamming. And she's like, oh, do you have some construction going on in the house? I'm like, no, it's just us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and, and, and our actress, uh, uh, who plays April, uh, Anna, uh, Anna Harrington uh, Pitt, she, uh, she, she, same thing, she was in Savannah, she swung by. And you can just feel the house get excited when they came in. Um, my brother... Uh, Freddie Shane McCullough has a part in the movie, and, and uh, we used one of his interviews in the movie. So his daughter had come over to visit, and, and I was like, oh, I'll show your dad, you know, yeah. show you your dad the movie. So I, I pull up on, uh, I pull a scene up on my monitor in, in my office, and the house went crazy. Mm-hmm. And she's like, what's that? I was like, oh, it's just the wind. She's like, there's, there's no wind inside your house. <laughs> you know, doors are slamming, and windows are going up and down. But it, it's this odd thing that, that – um, it just gets energized. I mean, you know, we signed our investment contract on February 1st. I just remember this so distinctly. And I wake up February 2nd, and I walk into my bathroom. And, again, I live alone. And uh, I just walk, walk in the room, and my mirrors in my bathroom are all fogged up. And there are these weird symbols drawn into the fog. Mm. One was a skull face, and then just a bunch of weird stuff. And that was just the beginning. It just kind of went crazy from there. But... Um, but I just get this sensation when I'm when I'm when I was working on the movie at the house, um, you know, both shooting it and in post production, that any time I started doing something with the film, I could feel the energy in the house just turn up. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely, and that is part and parcel to the whole idea of what what a spirit entity wants is that attention. They want that attention, and if you're bringing them attention, if you're presenting a story that will bring attention to them. That gives them, you know, it's spiritual currency, really. Yeah. You know, they're 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 always seeking it, and and that idea that when people show up, you know, it, it, it picks up is because they want more attention. They want that, you know, uh, pay attention to me, and and that's uh, I, I always say that the reason why so many ghosts are quote unquote scary, the the boo factor of a ghost is how immediate and how potent fear is as a a, a form of energy, uh, attention. You become hyper aware. You're focusing all that attention on these spirits and now you've created a story that i'm sure they're they're overwhelmed with the idea that there's a buzz about it and people are talking about it and it's not just it's not just in savannah it's it's across the country across Mm -hmm. the world Mm -hmm. people are being introduced to their story um, which also you know brings that interesting point like you wrote things into the script that you thought you were making up but they Mm -hmm. turned out to be true it's like well you know (laughs) that does fit a certain type of of idea where 
when you're trying to fill in the blanks, there's this kind of spiritual energy, you know, putting the spackle in the holes and you don't sense it as I'm being told this. You just have this inspiration, this ideation of what happened. Mm -hmm. And then you find out it's true. And it's like, that's not, that's not coincidental. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very much a, you know, uh, could be attributed to having ghosts that are more aware. Mm -hmm. And mind you, for the listeners at home, uh, aware ghosts are more dangerous than unaware ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, active hauntings that seem to have this intelligent response, these, uh, they can form agendas. You know, they can have wants that aren't primal because a primal want of attention, of food, of mm -hmm. nourishment, um, isn't the same as somebody becoming attached. You know, because... So, yep. you know, uh, uh, you kind of want to be mindful of spirits that might want something specific from you, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when, when people will start to throw the word demon around. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and I use the word demon a lot, but I don't mean in the classical sense, I don't mean fallen angels. I just mean an entity that mm -hmm. has lost its humanity or, yeah. or never had it, yeah. you know, uh, a predatory spirit or force or what have you. Um, and that's something that's interesting too is, is, uh, we, we have a term, we use succubus or incubus, which is basically a, um, an entity that attaches to you physically or, or, or emotionally. You know, it's mm -hmm. seeking a relationship with you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and in some ways, a, a very literal relationship with you. So uh, it's fascinating because I feel like there was such a wide variety of spirits in your house. Um, can you speak to, like, some of the different types of spirits that people have encountered? Sure. Sure. Well, one of the things that I, I had experienced uh, every time I came home to visit Savannah, and I didn't really put two and two together, I would often stay in the upstairs bedroom that, that you were inside. And it, we learned that, that was kind of the focal point of uh, there was a dark energy in that room. Um, there are many things in my house, and some of them I think are, are positive and good and supportive. I feel like they protect me. And there are, there, are, there are things in the house that are not so much that. Um, you know, I remember being in, in that bedroom and my dad would come upstairs. Uh, this obviously when I'd be visiting and he was still alive. And, and uh, he'd say, son, what are you slamming on the floor? I'm like, what are you talking about, dad? It's completely silent up here. I'm just reading a book. And he'd get aggravated at me because he'd think I was like throwing things on the floor. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I remember when I was uh, working on the script... I started working downstairs because I stopped staying upstairs in that bedroom <laughs> sure. because some things that happened, yeah. which we can cover later. And I remember one night specifically, it's about 2.30 in the morning, and I'm, I'm working on the script, and I hear this crash upstairs that literally sounded like someone had a sledgehammer and just hit the, the, the floor above me, the ceiling, as hard as they could. And I had my motorcycle outside the house, about 20 feet away from the house, with a motion sensor on it. This hit the floor so loudly it set off the motion sensor on my motorcycle so i thought something just crashed the roof fell in. You know, yeah. I didn't know. so i run upstairs run into the area above where i was lying and it's just a closet with like dresses nothing well we had a medium come to the house to say that she she saw what she said was uh, a slave a male slave and she said that sound that we all hear when we're downstairs is the slave with a giant rock trying to break the chains that are on his leg. He's mm -hmm. just slamming it against the chain. Um, that's one of the things that there, uh, you know, in the script, uh, a little girl plays a very important part of the story. I just made that up because little girls, I think, can be pretty damn creepy. Absolutely. <laughs> Only to learn later in, when interviewing multitudes of people who had stayed in the house, who had lived in the house, that they, many people had experienced a little girl in that house. Either they saw her, they heard her laughing. They heard her crying. Uh, they see her out of the corner of her eye like, running across the room. I never did up until uh, after I had written the script. I was staying in that upstairs bedroom. And I remember it was the last night that I stayed there. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I could hear a little girl whispering my name outside the window. And this is on the mm. second floor. Oh. And, and like so many people, you know, my partner's very smart. She's always telling me when something happens, she's like, grab your phone and record it. <laughs> yep. Well, the first three minutes, I'm trying to discount and make up excuses why it's not what it seems to be, right? So I wake up, and I hear my name clearly. I'm like, okay, I'm still dreaming, obviously. <laughs> you know, this is not real. 
but I wasn't dreaming. And I just remember getting up, and it's my whole body was just ice cold. And and I, I just like, screw this. And so I started walking out the room. And I remember as I crossed that threshold, I could just still hear her saying my name. And uh, But I had that experience after I had written the script about the little girl. You know, another another thing that plays pretty prominently into to script is that there was a plantation house on the property that gets burned down during the Civil War and uh, uh, the house in the movie gets built over. And it's, you know, I won't give too mm-hmm. much away, but it, it's, a, sure. it's a really key point in the, in the movie. Again, just made it up. And, uh, you know, we, we did a documentary about the history of the house. And so we brought in a historian who told us that there was a plantation on the property that was burned down during the Civil War. And I had zero idea of that. And, you know, things like that, I was just like, wow. Um, but there, you know, there, there was something in that upstairs bedroom that, you know, it, it, it was just dark. I don't know what it was. I mean, I, I've heard people refer to it as demonic, but we even had, uh, while we were there, we had discussion of it being a portal, mm-hmm. of, sure. of there yeah. seemingly being this incredible passage you know, uh, and and we, we we spent a good amount of time in that room because mm-hmm. it was so significantly charged. Mm-hmm. You know, you just knew that this this room, other than, you know, outside of the others, seemed to be almost like a battery. Mm-hmm. Like you know, this 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 could fuel the entire place, whatever's going on in this room. Um, because even that, it's interesting the story uh, of of the slave breaking its chain uh, in uh, with a rock. Um, does not sound like a, an event that could happen upstairs in a building. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the planes of, of whatever reality, it's, it's all about the source, you know, mm-hmm. how close to that, you know, source is it? Um, because that event probably didn't happen in that location. More likely that location mm-hmm. didn't exist, mm-hmm. you know, at the yeah. time, but whatever's drawing into your house is obviously, mm-hmm. you know, manifesting, you know, from there. Um, which, you know, a lot of people imagine that ghosts go about exactly as they are in real life. You know, if, if I die, it's going to look like me. It's going to walk on the floor. It's going to do all these things. As a matter of fact, there's a great ghost story at Fort Jackson where people have seen people marching, mm-hmm. ghosts marching, but they all look like they've been cut off at the knee. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that the ground of Fort Jackson had actually been built up by about a foot and a half. And so what's happening is they're walking on the original ground, mm-hmm. you know, the ground as they knew it. But ghosts aren't tethered to any logic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're not tethered to, you know, architecture. Uh, so I, I find that really interesting um, because I think we did spend a lot of time with conjecture because I think the little girl came up as a, uh, we, had, we had three not very experienced investigators with us and they were talking about a little girl, mm-hmm. the sensation that there was mm-hmm. a little girl there. You know, we had multiple uh, mediums come into the house. I think we had four. And kind of the thing, we, we didn't tell any of them about what anyone else had said. I just mm-hmm. wanted to see a fresh, you know, fresh set of eyes. And every single one of them talked about a portal being in that room. Yeah. Oh, I believe um, it. Yeah. You know, I, I remember, uh, again, to show how lacking in bravery that I am, uh, there was a point where at noon, middle of the day I would not walk upstairs like my upstairs was just off limits and if something happened and I need to go upstairs I would call my partner who lives in LA just to have her on the phone so that a grown man could walk upstairs <laughs> but I could feel it like it was literally as you walked up my stairs it was like walking into a heavy fog you could mm-hmm. feel it and when I'd go up to the to the bedroom door of that room you had a sensation when you know someone's on the other side of that door yeah. and uh, I remember one day I was downstairs again middle of the afternoon and I hear this crashing sound. And, and I look up, and in the room that I was in, all the pictures and paintings up had fallen off. I'm like, well, that's strange. And I walk into the living room. All the pictures, paintings have fallen off. Go through the whole downstairs. Every single thing that had been on the wall was on the floor. And then, so I call my partner. I was like, because I'm terrified. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I need to go upstairs and check. Um, 
I need you to be on the phone with me. So I go upstairs and everything in the entire house had fallen off the wall. And there was this huge mirror upstairs in, in the, in the, that one upstairs bedroom. It was this really old antique mirror that was like beautiful ornate wood and it had fallen and just shattered into a, a million pieces. Um, but I just remember there was, there was, there was no earthquake. There was nothing, you know, it was like, it was just, but this same moment, boom, wow. the entire house, uh, it just knocked everything off the walls. I find it honestly kind of frightening that the little girl knows your name because names yeah, are... I didn't like that either. Yeah, I, I can imagine um, because names are very powerful um, mm-hmm. in the paranormal world, if you will, because uh, you often see it in like fae lore, how, you know, yeah, they... You never answer your, it's just something calling your name. Exactly. Yeah, yeah because um, that's usually a very malicious entity. Um but it also means that it already has a connection to you in some way because it knows your name. So mm-hmm. uh, we actually talked about this in the last episode of, you know, sometimes these more demonic or malicious entities present themselves as children mm-hmm. um, to get you to trust them. But um, sometimes that intense curiosity builds them up and you start to see the uh, face behind the mask almost, you know, that the more malicious intent. So um, with that particular entity, did you start to notice her becoming more prevalent after the uh, script or the film was like in production? Like, was she becoming more intense, if you will? Well, the only experience I had with her was at one time in the upstairs bedroom. Uh, you know, I've heard people tell me, oh, you should talk to them, and which I absolutely, absolutely don't not. do <laughs> at all. Uh, I just ignore them. Um, other people had experiences, uh, again, prior to the movie, when we were making the movie, um, my, uh, my partner's got a little girl and you would put security cameras up. Uh, I, I used to have security cameras up in my house and I kept capturing horrifying things. So I took them down. I was like, they can just break in and steal things. I'll be okay. You sure. know, I'm tired of seeing this <laughs> yeah. stuff, but we put them back up because we want to see what we could capture. And, um, we captured her, her daughter who at the time was three in that upstairs bedroom, there was a little, uh, a little rocking horse that was there for the movie. And her little girl was there talking to someone in the room. And she told her mom, she said, Oh, it's a little girl I was talking to. Um, it's interesting. There was, there was a crew member who had stopped by the house to, uh, do something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't there. And Alexis wasn't there. So he walks in and he said that he was in that front room, again, the pit area, you know, with the aquarium and he felt very uncomfortable. And so he says, says out loud, Hey guys, I'm Mark's friend. I'm here working on a film. I, I mean, you no harm. He says he walks out and he gets in his car and checks his phone for messages. And he had a text message from himself that said, please come back inside. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and this was a guy who was an atheist, didn't believe in anything. Mm-hmm. He no longer doesn't believe in anything. <laughs> I, I can <laughs> believe changed, that. Well, even mind. that, that's interesting because there is kind of an interesting uh, conversation to be had because uh, a lot of times you can settle a haunting by speaking to it, by saying, I acknowledge you're here, please leave me alone, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Because that's the kind of in- attention that they want. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they want somebody to pay attention to them. And if they don't have to expend energy to get attention, you can sometimes nip a haunting in the bud by preemptively just saying, I'm here to do this, this, this. You're acknowledging their existence. They don't have to waste energy to bow, boo. And, and you can go about your business. Um, and if you know their name, if you know the mm-hmm. spirit's name, even more so, more power mm-hmm. to you because you're really, by, by calling out their name, as a matter of fact, in most rites of exorcism, you can't really expel a spirit until you know their name, mm-hmm. which is how we actually came up with Legion, which was a name that we gave to all demons. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that it, it, it helps in that sensation of, if you don't know that individual spirit's name, um, when a spirit learns is always my, my problem. Um, because I, I think of like, Ghosts like the cloud, you know, uh, you, you've got files on your computer, it goes into the cloud. Uh, when your computer dies, that's your body. When it dies, the access to the cloud is, is gone. The only thing that can access the cloud is another computer. What's in the cloud is all that you are. You're not going to learn anything. Nothing's going to be uploaded to the cloud. You don't get to learn new names, new people, new things. You exist as a series of the events of your life, your memories or whatever. It's in the cloud. 
Now, if there's something out there that has a computer Mm -hmm. (laughs) and is accessing the cloud to get to your information, now you're dealing with some other entity. You're not dealing with a ghost. You're dealing with something that's manipulating Mm -hmm. the information in the cloud. Um, And that becomes a a question. It's like if a ghost learns your name, learns your name, you're dealing with something else because a ghost doesn't have a brain to store information Mm -hmm. or process information. You're dealing with something that can <clears throat> that aside, if it knows your name, it might have known you in life. It might have become aware of you or know you, and then when they died, it was in the cloud, and then they can utilize you know, the cloud to access and see you. And that's a, it's an interesting way to make an analogy of the idea that our spiritual makeup needs a processing unit, needs mm-hmm. you know, a, um, some form of mechanics that's what our brain is that's what our bodies are without that it's just spiritual collection it just you know it's just there and accessible like we are operating systems so we can see the traces of the file we can read a file off the cloud if we have a password if we're in the right place yep. if not locked so when you when you put the, all those things in that framework you start to realize that if it knows your name if it's if it's if it's learning then it's got an operating system. And that operating system is not the spiritual. It's something else. It's, you know, it, it, let's say we're on one side, there's the cloud, and then there's something on the other side. And that side has a, a computer, and we have a computer. <laughs> you know, that becomes like this, this interesting debate over what can a spirit do? What can a ghost do? You know, um, we talk about intelligent haunts all the time. And most people will agree that an intelligent haunt is when you can communicate with the spirit and the spirit can furnish proof of communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, It does not necessarily mean they're going to learn who you are. They're going to have an understanding of who you are. Um, That... That's that's when you start getting to a little scary. Yeah. (laughs) That's 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 a slightly scary thing when things call out your name because throughout world history... Any spirit that calls your name is usually a bad thing. So like mm-hmm. she said, you know, we, we came up with fairy tales and fays. And, yeah. and uh, Look Behinds, I think, is the yeah. one in uh, Appalachia, yeah. where if it calls your name, you're supposed to just keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Look <laughs> forward. Never turn around. Just keep moving. Um, and that's a, th- this common trope throughout you know, every culture. It's like, spirit knows your name. Don't go do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I've obviously talked about my house a lot various places and various situations, but I never use the term ghost. I never use the term spirits because I have no idea. Right. Sure. Uh, Like I I love your approach and I always enjoy talking to you about this stuff, even if it's over coffee, because you're so knowledgeable about this world. Um, And again, we brought in, you know, when we were doing our documentary, we brought in, gosh, four or five mediums. Uh, We brought in a voodoo priestess we brought in eastern orthodox priests we brought in you you know but lots of folks lots of experts and what i found fascinating was the overlap uh the number of folks who from different backgrounds different skill sets different natural talents who saw who saw the same things had similar ideas and then also the different viewpoints as to what things were that were there but you know like i said i'm not a skeptic i certainly know there's something going on i just don't know what it is and uh, you know we we have a documentary that, that posits a lot of possible causes but i don't know if it's a ghost i don't know if it's a disembodied you know human mm-hmm. spirit i don't know if it's an evil demonic force i don't know if it's you know energy that's trapped in time that's just in a repeating cycle or if we're you know uh, i mean just get even crazy like if there's a, a, a another dimension that's kind of bleeding through ours and we're just at, a, at my house happens to be a place where they kind of bleed through and, and touch each other. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, you know, I live in the house I'm yeah. by myself in the house and I'm okay. Uh, you know, there used to be something in that upstairs bedroom that was terrifying and, and we brought in a demonologist and, and we got that thing out, whatever that thing is. And I know that now I can walk upstairs and I can be upstairs at night mm-hmm. working and I'm, I'm not terrified and I'm fine. Yeah. But there, there are certainly instances, I'd say two or three times a year, something happens that just chills me to the bone. 
and it's very usually things happen and I, and I actually chuckle to myself because it seems almost like a mischievous child playing around I'd say um, like three or four times a week I'll wake up to the sound of something falling over in the room above me and getting drug across the floor and it just it just feels like someone's screwing with me you know what I mean it doesn't feel scary it just feels like they're just screwing with me but then sometimes I'll wake up to my bedroom door knob turning 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 someone trying to come in or someone pounding on the on the sliding glass door to my bedroom that's scary to me you know okay. I've, I've woken up to the sound of a man's voice whispering outside my window but I can't make out what he's saying that's scary to me of course, I'd use, what I used to do is run out my gun to see, you know, obviously there's some psycho outside my yeah. window and there's no one there. And come back and say, and I still hear the, the, the whispering. But I don't know what it is, you know? And I just, um, I don't know. I think that is, uh, chief among all things that you should walk away with is no one knows. For all the experts, no one knows. And, and I am always reluctant to refer to myself as an expert uh, I am I am a constant uh, explorer, but no one knows, and so there comes this thing where it's it's not knowledge, it's faith, and that's where the people come up with different avenues. People believe certain things, and I think that helps them. Uh, and I've told people this. I think we even talked about it last yeah. time. Some people will carry weapons uh, to ghost hunts. <laughs> Because a weapon gives you confidence, it gives you faith that you can protect and defend yourself, and that that sensation would feel the same to a spirit, because a spirit also doesn't know. A spirit doesn't have more information than we do, it has different information than we do. And so when you show up and you're like, I'm gonna cut you, the spirit has to really think, can he? <laughs> Will he? You know, and, and by the determination of your faith, of, of your ability to say, I you know, defy you. And, and I have been witness to several exorcisms. And when I follow up, oftentimes the disturbance returns. But I believe that is because the spirit being freaked out by a priest with, you know, the whole um, holy water and burning sage and, you know, the mm -hmm. whole um, olive oil crosses and things, that the, the spirits are like, oh, that guy means business. He knows what he's doing. I'm being expelled. And so they just quiet down. They just yeah. like sit in the corner and they're like, well, I better not move because this guy says that he's compelling me to leave. And sometimes spirits don't know how. It's not as simple mm -hmm. as a spirit deciding to leave. You know, uh, a lot of times, and, and I've seen people who kind of like try to work a, a path for the spirits, less of an exorcism and more of a, almost like a counseling session. Like, mm -hmm. do you see a light? Is there a way out? Is there a door where you are? Because some people believe that spirits just get stuck in nooks and crannies in our world and want to show them a way out. So um, the, I, I think the takeaway is it's very healthy to say, I don't know. Like mm -hmm. I always say, I will use the term demon. I will use the term. And I say that because I'm not, I don't know, I'm not classifying it. I'm using the word to help me discuss it mm -hmm. but you know um and I, I i am i have a certificate in demonology i i, I studied it and it's basically learning names you know it's just, it, <laughs> basically yeah basically a <laughs> long list of names and, and and how they behave and things like that um but what was fascinating about that process was these were people doing the same thing i'm doing is trying to come up with a language to deal with this event and this thing um and these are things that worked for them Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't, and they may not be universal. Um, you know, I, I always say, you know, that's, that's great if you know this rites of exorcism, but what if the spirit doesn't share your faith? Mm -hmm. You know, what if it's, it, it doesn't recognize your church or your, you know, um, brand? Uh, that becomes a conflict of, well, mm -hmm. whose faith is stronger? Do you believe, do you truly believe stronger then the spirit believes it belongs. And can you believe stronger that the spirit needs to go than the spirit believes it needs to stay? And that's the conflict. The, the, the conflict of trying to rid a house of a spirit is your determination. You know, I remember years ago, uh, the first time we met was a mutual friend, Anthony that's right. I think, had, had connected us because I was freaking out about my house. And I remember you telling me that you'd gone to a lot of exorcisms and that 
most of them didn't stick. It's true. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, well, that sucks. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, again, it was reaching a point where uh, I was strongly considering leaving the house. And I didn't want to do that. because you know, People often ask me, like, you know, we did the film festival circuit with Savannah Haunting. And there would be, always be a Q&A afterwards. And, and one of the first questions is, why are you still there? You know, every, every, every haunted house movie, you're, you're like, just leave. Yeah. But it's like my dad built the house. He took this little tiny house and built around. And it's like my dad's, like, his story, his history just woven into the house. I, you know, I don't want to leave. Like, you know, everywhere I look, I'm reminded of him in a good way. And uh, so I did not want to leave. And I remember we, the, the person we brought in from L.A., who was a demonologist who, who got the thing out, uh, she too said there was a portal in that upstairs bedroom. And she said the same thing you did. She's like, look, she says, a portal. It's open. She goes, I'm going to close it. She goes, but here's the problem. Once it's closed, they're on the other side and they're pounding on that door, pounding on that door. And she goes, eventually they will reopen it. She goes, so you're going to get a respite, but you will not get this door closed forever. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always aware and if I feel that thing coming back, I know to not screw around, like get someone mm-hmm. in to like close Absolutely. that door again. Well, I even remember having a discussion with you about the, the, the concept of it being a um, deliberate act, that somebody opened it deliberately using mm-hmm. ritual, using, you know, and, and again, uh, whenever we talk about things like, um, again, for lack of a better term, witchcraft or, you know, ritualistic magic. Um, it, it is a, about having the, a tool like faith to poke a hole into that fabric, uh, you know, to the next station on the radio channel, um, utilizing this profound faith. And, and, and faith is always bolstered by ritual. Mm-hmm. When you perform a ritual, you are basically putting it into the world that it's real, that it's true, and that's all ritual is, is this continual uh, bombardment on reality that says my reality is based in this ritual that I do. And you can curb it because you are training your brain and you're training the environment to accept that this is the new reality. And this, that, that this reality includes having a hole <laughs> that allows for you know, strange and, and, and terrible entities to come through. Um, so, yeah, it, it's interesting because I do wonder often, whenever I hear about that, I'm always like, oh, I'm glad that it worked, but I'm worried that one day, you know, it will know not to mm-hmm. hide anymore. What's interesting, the last, uh, I keep using the word interesting because I don't know what else is <laughs> terrifying, actually, is a better word than interesting. <laughs> uh, the last uh, medium that I had out of the house just a few months ago, uh, again, I said nothing to about the history, nothing about what anyone else had done. And uh, he's standing at my front door and he's like, there is something running around your house as fast as it can go, just around and around and around looking for a way in. And I know what that is. It's the mm-hmm. thing that pound, pounds on my door and it yeah, whispers through the window. Right. It's the thing that that demonologist got out of the house. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what this person did was they, they buried these 50 pound rose quartz crystals right. mm-hmm. at each corner of my house, three feet deep, and then put basically a magic yeah. <laughs> force field around yeah, the house absolutely. to Award. keep that thing yeah. off or out. But it was interesting that, that this person showed up knowing nothing about that. And he's like, I, I can just see it running constantly, mm-hmm. wanting so badly to get back in your house, looking for an opening. Um, and you know, it's just like the, the visuals of that for me is pretty um, unsettling. It sounds like a sequel to me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. It does sound like a sequel. Let's hope that that's completely made up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's true. It's the same way when you practice witchcraft. You're always having to refresh your wards, always having to make sure your you know guards are staying strong because entities, I mean, that's what all they have to do is, you know, is be resilient. They, you know, they just have to have enough conviction to want to get back and they'll eventually do it. But, you know, if you're actively staying on top of it, you know, and making sure that your protections are still uh, just as strong as always, they're going to have a really hard time getting back in. So I wouldn't worry too, too much about, um, you know, uh, that this thing's going to penetrate back into your home with more conviction, I would say. I guess for me, and that act, the act of burying things, the the physical acts are far more um, tangible. 
mm-hmm. you know it happened, you know it's there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very similar to putting a cross on the wall. You know it's there and you know what it's there for. It's a constant reminder of the act that was taken to protect the environment. And that is a, that's a pretty drastic act. You know, mm-hmm. uh, giant pieces of rose quartz around your house is a huge endeavor. And you, you couple that with, 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 a, with a knowledge base of, of ritual and, and, and you have basically a ghost that doesn't know or a spirit or whatever entity that doesn't know the rules mm-hmm. and realizing I need to adhere because these rules are being outlined very clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. I always talk about, you know, um, one of the reasons why we etch people's names in tombstones you know, that's old magic, the old concept of if I put your name on the stone, then the stone holds you. It keeps you. It's got your name on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's to keep the spirit from coming home. You know, it mm-hmm. keeps the spirit in a place that is not going to bother you. And that ritual being reenacted and over-reenacted and, and throughout history and every culture says the dead belong in the cemetery, the dead belong in the graves stay you know mm-hmm. don't don't come home uncle carl i want you to just yeah. be in the ground mm-hmm. and that's such a fascinating thing because what an arcane ritual it is what an ancient and old ritual it is funereal proceedings but we still do it mm-hmm. so something in us is still recognizing the potency and the importance of that ritual mm-hmm. yeah i don't so much worry about that thing that's outside the house being able to get back in uh, what I do have small concerns about is that portal being reopened and something else coming through. That's <clears throat> And that's another yes. thing is, not to be, you know, ooh, uh, it's very possible that the, the spirit, as terrible as it was, was also, because, uh, and this is going to freak everyone out, um, every mirror on the face of the earth is haunted. Yes. Every one, every single one. The biggest, strongest spirit near a mirror will grab hold of it and keep all other spirits at bay. It will fight for this glance into our world. A portal is the same way. The biggest meanest is going to stand at the guard because it wants the energy of the portal. It wants the energy of the area that the portal came from. If you remove that one, the next biggest thing or a bigger thing with no fight might be on its way. (laughs) And if it's closed, it's closed. That's great. However... How closed, how secure, how tight, how, you know, uh, uh, and comes back to that wonderful phrase, I don't know. We just don't know. And we don't mm-hmm. understand it. You know, I, I, these are all hypotheticals. These are all just, oh, you know, I've heard from this and I've observed these things. Uh, and you, and it's, it's very likely we're totally wrong. We're totally off base. And um, I remember a movie... Jacob's Ladder. Do you remember Jacob's Ladder? Jacob's Ladder was an amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, watch Jacob's Ladder. Um, but there's a moment where uh, Jacob's chiropractor, played by Danny Aiello, says that angels would seem like demons to people who don't believe in heaven or who don't, who don't accept. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, an angel sent to help you will seem like a demon trying to hurt you. And I was like, how fascinating a concept. Because... It's, there's a good chance that we're just so high strung as, as, as humans that we don't recognize a spiritual aid versus a spiritual detriment. Sure. And for all the viewers who are now freaking out about their mirrors in their house, um, <laughs> maybe we'll make a TikTok about how to lock your mirrors. There are ways to protect yourselves. Don't go like smashing all your mirrors. So well, and, it's, uh, and, and by design, mirrors are generally locked in, in many occasions. You actually have to ritualistically pierce the, the, the glass of a, of a mirror, which is, you know, a Bloody Mary story for another day. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, the idea is any, any attempt to get into our world is opportunity. Every Ouija board is an attempt to get into our world. Everything that we have that we use to communicate or to delve into the other world is a door into our world. And that door is such a coveted thing. People really underestimate how awesome and wonderful the living world is because Mm -hmm. a lot of times it just seems like a crap show. So uh, the truth of the matter is it's wondrous and it's beyond compare. It it exists as a finite point measured in something we call time, which is endlessly valuable to spirits because they don't exist in those parameters. Um, Just imagine how valuable time is to those who do not have it at all. 
Well, on that note, um, I guess we're going to go ahead and wrap up. So, Mark, would you like to plug anything for the film? Uh, well, I can't share a lot yet. We just signed a distribution agreement, but unfortunately we can't um, give any info yet. But I certainly will let you guys know. Um, but you will be seeing it in theaters uh, relatively soon. Well, you heard that, so that's going to be awesome. Um, but thank you guys again for listening or watching. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on YouTube. Make sure to follow us on TikTok under the Savannah Underground. Um, but we do appreciate all of you. I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>